Hey, what's going on everybody? We're here at Laurel Land Memorial Park in Dallas, Texas, and we're here to visit the grave of somebody that was taken from us too soon. We're here to visit the grave and pay respects to Stevie Ray Vaughan. And I was pulling through and I saw this and I thought it it's locked. I don't know, I think it's just the pump house, but they made it look good anyway. It sure, it tricked me. I thought it was gonna be something more than a pump house, but that's all it is. So yeah, long story short, we're here to visit Stevie Ray Vaughan, celebrate his life, talk about the tragedy with the plane crash and all that stuff, and or the helicopter crash. And um, I just wanna say, if this is your first time here, let me get the ad out of the way and say, if this is your first time here, welcome. I hope you enjoy the video. If you do, please consider liking, subscribing, sharing, you know, doing all those things. And if this isn't your first time here, welcome back. I hope you enjoy the video. Give a shout out to my members. You guys are awesome. Thanks for being members. Um, we got the merch, we got the liquid IV. I, know, I think I said in the Charlie Pride video, like it's hot, stay hydrated. You don't have to use my liquid IV. Just drink you some water, man. I don't want nobody Nobody needs to get dehydrated and get hurt. So just drink you some water. So yeah, I'm gonna get this camera turned around. We're gonna go walk through the cemetery. We'll talk about Mr. Vaughn, his life, do all those things. And then we'll go find the grave and pay our respects. So Stevie was born October 3rd of 1954. And the family moved frequently and lived in other states such, such as Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Oklahoma before they ultimately settled here in Dallas. A shy and insecure boy, Vaughn was deeply, deeply affected by his childhood experiences. His father struggled with alcohol abuse and often terrorized his family and friends with his bad temper. In the early 1960s, Vaughn's admiration for his brother Jimmy resulted in his trying different instruments. And in 61, for his seventh birthday, Vaughn received his first guitar. A toy guitar from Sears with a Western motif on it. Gotta go back and lock the car. Forgot to do that. There's nobody here but me and you, but still, you never know, right? So, in 1970, Vaughn joined a band called The Liberation, which was a nine-piece group with a horn section Having spent the past month briefly playing bass with Jimmy in a band called Texas Storm, he had orig originally auditioned as a bassist. Impressed by Vaughn's guitar playing, the group's original guitarist said, you know what, I'll just go play the bass, you play the guitar. Once he heard Stevie play, he knew his place in the band was playing bass. And in the mid 70s, they performed at the Adolphus Hotel in downtown Dallas, I hope I said that right, where ZZ Top asked him to perform. During Liberation's break, Vaughn got to jam with ZZ Top on the nightcap song, Thunderbird. Attending Justin F. Kimball High School during the early 70s, Vaughn's late night shows contributed to his neglect of his studies, including music theory. He would often sleep during class, and Vaughn later spoke of his dislike of school and recalled having received daily notes from the principal about his grooming. Like, of course he wouldn't like school. He's Stevie Ray Vaughan. He's not meant to go to school. Like, he was destined to play the guitar, right? It's weird how, like, of course he wasn't gonna be good at school. He's Stevie Ray Vaughan. Like, even his musical studies class, he was like, eh, do I really? I don't really wanna do that. So in late January 71, feeling confined by playing pop hits with Liberation, Vaughn formed his own band, Blackbird. After growing tired, of the Dallas music scene, he dropped out of school and moved with the band to Austin, which had more liberal and tolerant audiences. I feel like we hear a lot about Austin and it's still that way this day. There Vaughn initially took residence at the Rolling Hills Club, a local blues venue that would later become a soap, become the Soap Creek Saloon. Oh, let me get the key. Blackbird played at several um, clubs in Austin and open shows for bands like Sugarloaf, Wishbone, and uh, Wishbone Ash, and then Zypher, but could not maintain a consistent lineup. In early December of 72, Vaughn left Blackbird and joined a band called Cracker Jack, with like a K, I guess so, you know, copyright. He performed with them for less than three months. 
So in 75, Vaughn joined a six piece band called Paul Ray and the Cobras, which included guitarist Danny Freeman and saxophonist Joe Sublett. For the next two and a half years, he earned a living performing weekly at a popular venue in town, the Soap Creek Saloon, and ultimately the newly opened Antones, widely known as Austin's home of the blues. In late 76, Vaughn recorded a single with them, Other Days, as the A-side, and Texas cover as the B-side. Playing guitar on both tracks, the single was released in February of 77, and in March, the readers of the Austin Sun voted them as Band of the Year. In addition to playing with the Cobras, Vaughn jammed with many of the influences of his influences at Antones, including Buddy Guy, Jimmy Rogers, and even Albert King. So Vaughn renamed the band he was with to Double Trouble, taken from a title of an Otis Redding, an Otis Rush song. And in October of 78, Vaughn and Double Trouble earned a frequent residency performing at one of Austin's most popular night spots, the Rome Inn. Although popular in Texas at the time, Double Trouble failed to gain national attention, but the group's visibility improved when record producer Jerry Wexler recommended them to a guy named Claude Nobbs, organizer of the, the Montreal Jazz Festival. He insisted the festival's blues night would be great for them, who he called who he called Vaughn a jewel, one of those rarities who comes along once in a lifetime. And Nobbs agreed to book Double Trouble in July of 82. So Vaughn opened with a medley of arrangements of Freddie King's song, Hideaway, and his own fast instrumental, in sorry, it's still early, and his own instrumental cover of Rude Mood. Double Trouble went on to perform a rendition of Larry Davis, Texas Flood, Hound Dog Taylor's Give Me Back My Wig, and Albert Collins' Collins Shuffle, as well as three original compositions, the famous Pride and Joy, Love Struck Baby, and Dirty Pool. The set ended with boos from the audience. Can you imagine Stevie Ray Vaughan playing and then getting booed? This is not the last time we hear about that either. According to road manager, the, according to the road manager, the way I remember it, the oohs and boos were mixed. But Stevie was pretty disappointed. He had just handed me his guitar and walked off stage. And I was like, hey, are, are you, you guys coming back? There was a doorway back there. The audience couldn't see the guys, but I could. He went back to the dressing room with his head in his hands. And I went back there finally, and that was the end of the show. Can you, could you possibly, like, I, boo, Stevie Ray Vaughan. I don't know, maybe people weren't ready for it. So the following night, Double Trouble was booked in the lounge of the Montreal Casino, the Montreal Casino, with uh, Jackson Brown in attendance. Brown jammed with Double Trouble until the early morning hours and offered them free use of his personal recording studio in downtown Los Angeles. And in late November, the band accepted his offer and recorded 10 songs in two days. While they were in the studio, Vaughn received a telephone call from David Bowie. <laughs> like, you know, just get a phone call from David Bowie, no big deal. Who had met him after his uh, Montreal performance. And he invited him to participate in a recording session for his next studio album, Let's Dance, in January of 83. Vaughn recorded guitar on six of the album's eight songs, including the title track, China Girl. The album was released in April of 83 and sold over three times as many copies as Bowie's previous album. Got that, just got that touch, doesn't he? So after acquiring the recordings from Bowie's studio, Double Trouble began assembling the material for a full length LP album, Texas Flood. Opens with the track, Love Struck Baby, which was written for Lenny on their Love Struck Day. That's his, his wife. He composed Pride and Joy and I'm Crivin'. And he composed Pride and Joy, and I'm Crying, it's hard to put words together, for one of his former girlfriends, uh, Lindy. Although both are musically similar, as far as sound goes, their lyrics are two different perspectives of the relationship. One good, one not so good. Released on June 13th of 83, Texas Flood peaked at 38, and ultimately sold around half a million copies. So in January of 84, Double Trouble began recording their second studio album, couldn't stand the weather 
at the power station with John Hammond as EP, which is executive producer, and engineer Richard Mullen. Couldn't Stand the Weather was released in May of 84, and two weeks later it had rapidly outpaced the sales of the previous Texas flood. It peaked at number 31 and spent 38 weeks on the charts. So in March of 85, Recording for Double Trouble's third studio album, Soul to Soul, began at the Dallas Sound Lab here in Dallas. And as the sessions progressed, Vaughn became increasingly frustrated with his own lack of inspiration. He, he was also allowed to relax, like have a relaxed recording pace to record the album, which contributed to the lack of focus due to excess alcohol and drugs and stuff. <laughs> and they said, that gum fly? Man, that thing is attacking. That thing came in like kamikaze. Anyway, he was also allowed to a lack, a lack of pace, right? Which did not help with his drugs. And at the height of his substance abuse, he drank about a quart of whiskey and used about seven grams of Coke a day, which that sounds like a lot. During the album's production, Vaughn appeared at the Houston Astrodome in 85, where he performed the, a slide guitar version of the, the national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. His performance was met with booze again. Upon leaving the stage, Vaughn acquired an autograph from a former player of the New York Yankees, Mickey Mantle. Cheesy plug, we were just here visiting his grave. And released in September of 85, Soul to Soul peaked at 34 and remained on Billboard 200 through mid-86. Eventually, it was certified gold. So Double Trouble's fourth studio album, In Step, began in Memphis at Kiva Studios working with produce, producer Jim Gaines and co-songwriter Duel Barnhall. According to Vaughn, the album was titled In Step because I'm finally in step with my life, in step with myself, in step with my music. In Step was released in June of 89, and eight months later it was certified gold. The album was Vaughn's most commercially successful release and his first one to win a Grammy. It peaked at 33 on the Billboard 200 and spent 47 weeks on the chart. And Step included the song Crossfire. That's the, that's the big one for me, which was written by Double Trouble, Bill Carter, and Ruth Ellsworth. It became his only number one hit. So on Monday, August 27th of 1990, at 12.50 in the morning, Vaughn and members of Eric Clapton's touring entourage played an all-star encore jam session at Alpine Valley Theater at that resort in East Troy, Wisconsin. They then left for Midway International Airport in Chicago in a Bell 206B helicopter, the most common way for acts to enter and exit the venue, as there is only one road in and out, which is heavily used by fans. The helicopter crashed into a nearby ski hill shortly after takeoff. The helicopter was owned by a Chicago-based company, Omni Flight Helicopters. The Elkhorn, the coroner found that all five men died instantly. His funeral service was held on the, held on the 31st of August. An estimated 3,000 mourners joined the procession, led by a white hearse. Here we go. It says, thank you all for the love you passed our way. Stevie Ray Vaughan. Stephen Ray Vaughan. So yeah, if we look right up here, you'll see his brother's buried here as well. See, there's Vaughn, there's Jimmy Lee right there. You guys, this is uh, this is a big one for me. It's a big one. This is great. All oh, the guitar picks. Here, you don't want to look at me. You want to look at the grave. Look at the the hearts and the guitar picks. And I like the star, the burst of star. That's neat. Great. That's really cool. Now let's try to get a shot like, like that. Stevie Ray Vaughan, man, like that is awesome. Like when I imagine 
you know, this channel starting a couple of years ago and doing the things that you and I've got to do, I never would have thought Stevie Ray Vaughan, like very influential in my life, as I hope in many of yours as well. Like, that's awesome. Man, that's cool. Like, it's very few and far between that I have to just take a minute because it's that important. So yeah, thanks for watching. I do appreciate it. You guys, I, I really do appreciate all the stuff, all the kind words, all the comments, all the things. Like, I'll keep it short and sweet because Stevie Ray Vaughan, man. Like, his music, can't even describe it. And how could people boo him? You know, like, how is that even a thing? Like, I guess they just didn't, I guess, I mean, everybody has their own thing. I get it, but it seemed like he was a little bit different. I don't know. Sometimes you can just, they're special. So, yeah, thanks for watching. I do appreciate it. I know I say it over and over and over, but I really do, man. It means the world to me that you guys enjoy what I do. So, you know what? You never know what you're going to find on the back roads. I'll see you guys next time. Stevie Ray Vaughan.